Hello, welcome to the conversation in New Central Television. This is a program where we bring you up to speed with all the political happenings on the African continent. I am Binga Borowa. Today on the program, we will look at Nigeria, where the president has reassured Nigerians that the current fuel price remains after rumored fuel price increase. Also on the program, we will switch gears to the economic situation in Kenya, following public anger over the high cost of living. The government has made a U-turn reinstating small subsidy uh, to stabilize retail fuel prices for the next 30 days. But we begin our program in Nigeria, where President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has reassured Nigerians that his administration is taking measures to address the rise in fuel prices without reversing the decision to exit the subsidy regime. The President's Special Advisor on Media and Publicity, Ajuri Inglale, conveyed that efforts are on the way to address inefficiencies within the petroleum industry, despite the Nigerian Labour Congress, NLC, threatening an indefinite nationwide strike over potential fuel price increases. President Tinubu urged stakeholders to approach the situation with caution, emphasising the need for fact-finding and diligence before conclusions are reached. Now, joining me on the programme to discuss this is Olu Cheson Okwade, a public affairs analyst. He joins from Lagos, Nigeria, and also Dr. Jide Johnson, director of special programs at the Nigerian Institute of Journalism, uh, will join us later during the course of our conversation. I would like to start with Olu Cheson. How significant is President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's reassurance uh, to you regarding curbing full price increases while maintaining subsidy uh, in Nigeria? Uh, thank you very much, Arbenga, and good evening to all our viewers. Uh, the news from the special advisor to the president on media, a jury reassuring on uh, government not further increasing the price of petroleum. It's coming to all... Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, petroleum products, uh, and uh, the two mechanized, the two factors that contribute to the cost of uh, the pricing of PMX is still uh, going high, and this is the cost of uh, the, the crude oil at the international market and the cost of foreign exchange. So uh, coming up, uh, it's beginning to look like uh, there is a reintroduction of the back end because by analysis if uh, you are bringing the same quantity of product at the same dollar rate last month uh, which were it was around 760 uh, something you should know that if you are bringing the same thing at this point at the parallel market it will be costing as much as 960 uh, per uh, dollar so these are the factors that we consider but we are still uh, looking at the mechanism that the government are going to put in in order to uh, relieve the body in such a way that it doesn't go beyond the current price of 568. Now, stay with you, Lucia Son. Uh, what the presidential spokesperson did say, you know, the Tinubu administration is uh, putting in efforts to address inefficiencies in the petroleum industry. You know, they're working towards uh, putting the Port Harcourt's uh, refinery back online and also a few other things here and there. Uh, given the locks of hindsight, do you think uh, this was a hasty decision to remove uh, the subsidy? Did the government put the cart before the horse? And uh, should they have done all these things before the removal of the subsidy? Because we can see its ripple effect and Nigerians are really, really complaining that it's, it's biting hard. Lucia, so are you there? Yes, go ahead, please. Mr. President, yeah, I'm with you. I'm okay. with you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. loud and so loud I and think uh, there seems to be a slight. I, there seems to be a slight mistake calculation on the part of uh, the current administration. Uh, 
all believed that by now we are going by the submission of the last administration that we show up the uh, 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 commercial production from that Dangote refinery. They promised April at the time they moved to June and they were looking at the July. But here we are in August, we have not actually seen the production of that. And uh, it was based on that I felt that the uh, President, pre, pre, President Bola Tinubu took the action that we need to remove it and uh, possibly, you know, have the uh, uh, feel of the pain, maybe for one month, when they will start the operation, but that has not become operational now. And uh, it's like they are actually putting the cap before the house uh, uh, in, in this kind of a thing. So if the refinery is coming up, uh, possibly by the end of this year, I think it will be uh, better for us to revert to uh, maybe a pushing effect of uh, paying the subsidy for the next two, three months. Why do I say this? There seems to be uh, an attack on uh, productivity. Most people, most organizations, people cannot afford to go to work. And if this continues, even if you don't increase it beyond what we have currently, it's already a body. The purchasing power of an average citizen is pretty low, and you might discover that you'll be having a downturn in the aspect of production. Uh, if you look at the road, how many people can actually move around? And there's some of the palliatives that were claimed by this administration to provide. We are yet to see anyone of them you know, being put in line in terms of uh, the CNG buses uh, that going to be distributed mm -hmm. among the states and the relief that we are from say only Lagos state maybe that is giving 50 percent you know of the of the cost of transportation might be singing a sign of relief well what becomes of uh, other okay thank you Olusha. so we feel yeah. that uh, we might have to go back to status quo Okay, uh, Olusha Sorkwade says we might have to go back to status quo. He also mentioned uh, the attack on productivity. If you've uh, driven around Lagos in recent times, you've noticed uh, the uh, reduction, huge reduction in vehicular movement and of people. And he also talked about uh, the drop in purchasing power of Nigerians. So I'd like to bring in our second guest into this conversation, Dr. Jide Johnson, a Director of Special Programs at the Nigerian Institute of Journalism. A warm welcome to you, uh, Dr. Johnson. Good, good you guys. It's a pleasure to be with you and good day to our viewers all over the world. Thank you for having me. A uh, warm welcome, uh, Dr. Johnson. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Now, Dr. Johnson, could you elaborate on the factors that prompted the Nigerian Labour Congress to yet again issue a threat of a nationwide strike in response to potential fuel price increases? And how do you perceive the overall political climate surrounding this issue? Uh, and just to give you a background to this, the Nigerian Labour Congress has held several meetings uh, with the uh, Tinubu administration since its, since its inception. And all we get is warnings and, you know, they have failed to carry out their threat. So what do you make of uh, all of this? And are they really uh, representing the interests of the Nigerian workers? Because they don't seem to have done anything about the multiple well, fold um, increases in, let's, let's, in cost of living. Let's, let's establish the fact that there's no economy, there's none in the world, that leaves everything to the forces of the market. Everything is regulated by agencies of government. So, there, are one, there is always one form of intervention by government agencies in the regulation of every sector. Now, not to talk of the oil and gas sector, which is the mainstay of the Nigerian economy. Don't forget that our economy is a uniproduct economy. We all rely on the oil and gas sector, particularly the premium motor spray. So the initial step taken by the Bola Ahmed Inubu administration during his inaugural speech, um, created a lot of ripple effect mm. in the sense that it contributed to the inflation that led to increasing cost of goods and services and the untold hardship that attended it and the intention of government to solve the problem through palliatives. And that, like you pointed out in your monologue, there were attempts to have discussion and conversation 
with the Nigerian Labour Congress to forestall them from going on strike. However, we could see another policy statement by the president with respect to unified um, exchange rate, which leave um, the, the marketers in the oil and gas sector at the whims and the caprices of people selling currency. And the exchange rate in terms of the value of Naira to the dollar keep increasing. So as a result of that, if government does not intervene, definitely they will see incessant increase in the oil and gas sector, particularly premium motor speed. And if that happens, the side effect on the entire economy is huge. And that's why I think that the administration, um, through the special advisor to the president on media and publicity, yesterday gave an assurance that the president is going to intervene, is going to ensure, is determined, let me use his word, is determined to ensure that um, the prices of petroleum product does not go up. And in that regard, you can see that that's an indirect subsidy. The uh, question exactly. you ask is, if, if it's why do we if it's been deregulated, it means it should be left to the market forces. That's, that's the base of my own argument. The base of my own argument is there's no 100% deregulation. Mm. Let's talk, okay, for example, you and I work in the broadcast industry, work in journalism. We have a regulator that is called the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission. You cannot just... So in every industry, there are regulators. You have, the, you have DPR, you have an NPC. If you are leaving everything to the forces of the market, then there's no basis for us to have government agencies regulating the conduct of the affairs of the petroleum uh, down sector of the Nigerian economy. So as far as this issue is concerned, government is trying to retrace its step. We should salute their courage in doing that. Because what the administration will have done is to have evaluated the situation of things before coming up with this policy statement during his inaugural speech, mm. which invariably has backfired. That's the truth. It has backfired. We could see the, the implications the implications of it. We could see some organization asking their workers to come three days in a week. We are seeing some organization or some state government trying to promise their staff some palliative. In the, in the process of trying to ameliorate the pains of the removal of subsidy, you are also reducing the level of productivity. Because if your staff are coming to work three days in a week, what happens to the two days they are not coming to work? So it's, 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 it's about the administration being in haste to just lay down a marker. And I think that they, should, they need to retrace their step. There's the need for us to increase our, our local production to ensure that the refineries are working before we go about removing petroleum subsidies. And then to deal with the issue of corruption in that particular sector. Who are those powerful interest groups that mm. are making money out of Nigeria? You need to cut that down. Once you reduce that level, then the, we know the actual consumption we have, then government will be able to, to subsidize the actual consumption of petroleum products we consume daily in Nigeria. Now, staying with you, Dr. Johnson, you did uh, say the uh, subsidy remover has backfired, looking at the drop in the level of production, the purchasing power of ordinary Nigerians, and the low in economic uh, activities. Uh, looking at... Uh, given the luxury of hindsight and looking at the fact that, you know, the three major candidates in the uh, elections did vow to remove subsidy at some point in the administration or not. And there's a general consensus that, you know, this subsidy regime was hemorrhaging our uh, foreign reserves and we were bleeding a lot of FX that could be done and money that could be channeled into more productive uh, economic activities to stimulate uh, the economy and also health and education, uh, uh, what a view. Uh, given this as a background, how does the deregulation policy pursued by President Tinubu's administration align or diverge with previous attempts to address fuel pricing challenges in Nigeria? Looking at our history and what lessons might be drawn from these historical efforts uh, going forward? Uh, I think that the president was, was, was in a hurry to lay down a marker in the sense that to announce that the new sheriff is in town, and this new sheriff means business. However, in terms of the execution of that policy statement in his inaugural speech, I think it was too early, it was too hasty. One, I don't forget that the president has not constituted his, his um, federal executive mm -hmm. council, which happens to be the cabinet that you work with him. The presidency is not made up of one individual, it's made up of collective people constitutionally. 
that decision, he should have formed his cabinet and assigned ministries to his cabinet and set up a committee to look into the matter, evaluate this issue. Probably after 100 days in office, he comes and announced to Nigeria, having evaluated the situation of things and bringing all the scorecard, making himself accountable to Nigerians, telling them that these are the challenges we have, and this is the step, these are the alternatives, these are the options. I can assure you that a lot of Nigerians will agree with him. However, the, the approach that was adopted was hasty. It was done in a hurry. And that's the reason why um, we say slow and steady win the race. Um, it's a four-year, it's a four-year, it's a four-year time, mm -hmm. and um, you have you have all the time in the world to, to adequately plan. It's slow and steady. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, I think that the president was in a hurry in making that policy statement without even evaluating the situation. I don't know how many files he has read. I don't know how many documents has been exposed to him. I don't know the technical report he has received with respect to that particular sector of the economy before coming out with that policy statement, which allegedly some have said that it was not even part of the speech. I am mm. not a speech writer. It was <laughs> allegedly said that it was not part of the speech. That subsidy has gone part. Yeah. That okay. was, not, was not part of the speech initially. The, the president just made that pronouncement impossibly. And public governance is not about impulse. It's about detailed planning. And you could see that from the implications of that particular policy statement, you could see that the ripple effect has had consequent effect on the image of the administration, on the image of his political party, on the entire um, public perception of, 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 of what the administration, whether the administration is working in the interest of Nigeria or is working in the interest of the, of the elites. Because... It's, it's clear you and I can feel it. An average man on the street can feel it. An average man on the street can feel it. An average person on the street can feel it. You can feel the pants. Mm -hmm. Because like I pointed out early, it's, it's a, it's, it's a monoproduct economy. Now, we, you, could, you could also see the terms of, in terms of the policy flipped off, in terms of palliative. Initially, you recall that they said they were going to give some household 8,000 naira. They were going to use an old list. There were, there were issues and cries concerning that. That and was, was reversed, yes. Then they had a meeting with the governor. They had a meeting with the governors, and then a lot of comments that generated a lot of comments. People saying that no, it will be politicized by the governor. It tells you about how this policy was quickly put up without a thorough and detailed plan. Mm. Now, thank you, Dr. Johnson. I'd like to bring back Olusha Sonkwante, our second guest, into uh, the conversation. Uh, deregulation means, you know, leaving. Uh, the economics uh, to market forces. But uh, Dr. Johnson said there's no way in the world where you have 100% deregulation. Uh, that's why uh, you have uh, regulators to regulate certain industries. Uh, now, uh, Olusha, so given the emphasis of maintaining comp competitive tension among subsectors of the petroleum industry, uh, we've also recently seen that marketers are saying, look, we can't sell at this price. We want to sell at over 700 because of the devaluation of the Naira. It does affect uh, their business uh, model and it eats uh, deep into their profit because they have to import uh, these products uh, with Forex. Now, Lucia, so can you provide insights into the specific regulatory frameworks uh, that President Tinubu plans to put in place to ensure a level playing field now that they're suggesting a sort of temporary uh, subsidy to maintain the price at the uh, at the at level it is now. Oh, thank you very much for being here. Just like uh, Mr. Johnson said, there is no way in the world where you have 100% uh, 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 as we have obtained in our Okay, uh, we seem to be having connection issues with Lucia Sol Quadia. Our engineers uh, will work on that and we hope to have you back soon. Now, back to you, uh, Dr. Johnson. Still staying on this issue of the uh, temporary uh, sort of subsidy that the government plans to bring back. Are we not slowly crawling back uh, to the subsidy regime and uh, how much? of a buffer uh, would it be? Does it mean that the government plans to keep the price in at this level uh, between, you know, 
that between 500 uh, and 650 in some parts of the country and how long will they have to do that for and does does it not mean bringing the subsidy back uh, through the back door well it's it's, it's just uh, binga it's, it's about transparency it's about government being accountable it's about providing nigerians with detailed information as far as you and i are concerned and as far as a lot of operators in this sector are in this sector are concerned nobody knows the amount of crude oil we produce daily one nobody knows the amount of crude oil we export daily two nobody knows the amount of just look at when the subsidy was removed and look at the the, the drop in the in the in the in the in the local consumption mm -hmm. of, of 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 nigerians so what we require from government it's for government to do what we have elected them to do. We have elected them to protect us. We have elected them to provide us with services. We have not elected them to give us excuses. There can't be any non-state actors bigger than the state. What is the mm -hmm. level of consumption? There is no society where you don't enjoy one form of level of subsidy or the other. In, in Western world, agriculture is heavily subsidized. Food is the cheapest thing because there's a form of government subsidy for the agrarian sector. Now, if in Nigeria we can't produce locally and our economy, and then we don't have power, the only source of means of generating power is through PMS and diesel, which people use to power their, 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 their industry. And the industry you have will contribute to the level of activeness of your industry, of your, of your manufacturing sector and your productive sector. We determine what you have as a GDP. So if we actually want to do that, then government must ensure that succor is provided for people operating at the local level. You can call it subsidy, you can call it whatever. When they are talking about palliative and the rest of it, it's a, it's a form of subsidy. As far as I'm concerned, the issue is very simple. There's no way that there won't be one form of subsidy or the other mm. for us in the oil and gas sector. And the earlier the government comes to terms with that, the better. And what Nigerians are requiring is very simple. Be plain about it. Some people have been making money out of this. However, there is the need for us to deal with those that are making money from it, denying Nigerians of enjoying the benefit that you have been endowed by God with the oil. Now, Dr. Johnson, uh, news just, and I'm sure you've seen this news, uh, the latest statistics by the Nigerian uh, Bureau of Statistics on inflation. Had, uh, had inflation just hit 24.08%. Uh, there's increase in uh, price of uh, food. And this happens to be the highest in uh, 18 years, the highest level of inflation recorded in 18 years, in the past 18 years. I know you did touch on the impact, on the socioeconomic impact of the removal of the subsidy, but I want us to uh, delve deeper into it. What's the social economic impact of the removal of the subsidy on PMS consumption rates and petrol uh, pump prices, uh, taking into consideration potential effects on inflation, which we've seen consumer spending, and overall uh, economic stability. What steps can be taken to salvage uh, this situation and bring some level of soccer uh, to Nigerians? The CNG-operated uh, buses, uh, they are yet to come online. And uh, Mr. President spoke to Nigerians about two weeks ago. And, you know, people need to fend for themselves on a daily basis. Uh, they can't keep waiting for uh, this uh, palliatives uh, to... To come, uh, there are real life implications to uh, the decisions taken by the government. Well, um, if you have, that's approximately 25% percent, um, percent inflation rate. Mm. That's that that's unbelievable. That and there's there's nobody that can survive with under that under that kind of inflation rate. I, I would like to use an illustration to just drive it home. I'm a local barber. I operate a barbing shop. Mm. And then I don't have electricity. I have to power my barbing shop with a generator. And then I have to buy that fuel at 560. And then I use five liters. Five liters per day. 560 times five times five is about, let me say, approximately three, three, 
3,000 Naira. 3,000 Naira times 30 days, that's 90,000 90, Naira. Mm. On just overhead for a small enterprise, 90,000 Naira on just the overhead for powering alone, not to talk about other bills. Now, situate that with also a civil servant whose minimum wage is 30, uh, 30 less than 40,000 Naira. Mm -hmm. It takes for you to leave from Ogba, for example, to Ogba in Ikeja, to go to, to Aja if he works in Aja, you will spend 2,000 2, Naira. So if you, on a daily basis, in a week he's spending 10,000. So even if he's earning 40,000 Naira in a month, that means that the entire 40,000 Naira is earning, we go on transportation. So the wide implication until you drive it home, you break it down in bits and pieces. The unfortunate thing is that people making policies for us in Nigeria don't use public utility. It is provided. It is provided. All, all, all what they require is provided for them. The Secretary mm. to the Federal Government has been in government since 1999. The Senate President has been in government since 1999. The President has been in government and not out of government since 1999. So if you look at the people at the aims of affairs, None of them in the last 25 years has used his own money. So, so therefore, there's a disconnect out. between uh, these leaders and the reality of majority of oh, Nigerians. Yeah, that, 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 that disconnect that do not make them to realize the level of poverty, the level of impoverishment, the level of hardship that an average Nigerian is going through because they are far away from one, they are shielded, they are cars. Their, their, their vehicles are screened. Their vehicles are screened. They are shielded from reality. They drive four-wheel drives, so they don't know whether there are potholes or no potholes on, on the ground. Their, their, their houses are powered. If there is no electricity, it will be powered by generator. So I'm not sure they, 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 they've experienced what an average Nigerian has experienced in the last now, Dr. Johnson, years. as a That's matter of urgency, been. as a matter of urgency, as a matter of life and death, uh, we know that President spoke to Nigerians a few weeks ago, giving uh, reassurances that, you know, he, they, they can feel the pulse and the pain of Nigerians. What can they do immediately to bring some immediate relief uh, to Nigerians to ease this uh, hardship? A lot, a lot of people will not agree with me. A lot of people will not agree with me, but I think that we need to go back to the subsidy regime mm -hmm. and government to put in place measures that will stop people from making this nation dry. That's, that's one. And two, and I think that the government need to revisit the issue of this single. You see, for you, for us to, um, for us, you have to strengthen naira. And how do you strengthen naira? You have to increase your GDP. You yeah, can't production. Just, just make a sweeping statement and expect that naira we appreciate with the value of the dollar without your economy being productive. You so so we need to improve our productivity. And how do we improve our productivity? is by allowing us, the sector of the economy, to function. And if your economy is based on a uni, uni product economy, and that, econo that uni product economy is subjected to the free forces of the market forces, yes. to the free fall of the market forces, then invariably your economy cannot be productive. If your economy is not productive, Naira cannot appreciate. If Naira does not appreciate, the IC becomes untold. And that's just the reality. The two policy statements the president made in his inaugural speech, he needs to have a rethink. As soon as he puts his cabinet in place, for example, they screen all the ministers, even the ministers, had, we had expected that by the time they finish the screen, by Monday or Tuesday, they will have sworn in the ministers, they will have been assigned portfolios, and then they can have a strategic session on how to move this economy forward. And I think that's, that's, the, that's, that's, the, right, that's, the, that's the needed step that the president needs to take. There's, look, no matter how long you go in the wrong direction, the best way to move forward is to turn backward. So sometimes turning backward might be making progress. Okay. Turning uh, backward yes. might, might be making progress. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, a fine place to go on a break. We're still discussing uh, the president's statement that uh, the federal government is going to intervene and the, fuel, the price of fuel will not go up. And I still have uh, Ulusheso Kwade, public affairs analyst, and Dr. Jude Johnson here on the discussion. We'll go on a quick break and when we return, uh, we'll continue our conversation. Do stay with us. Yeah, welcome back to the conversation in New Central Television. Nigeria's President Bharat Ahmed Tinubu uh, says current petrol prices 
will remain. And uh, joining me on this discussion is Dr. Jide Johnson, uh, Director of Special Programs at the Nigerian Institute of Journalism. I also have Olusheson Okwade, a public affairs analyst. Uh, thanks for staying on the program, gentlemen. I would like to begin the second half with Olusheson uh, Okwade. A few weeks ago, Mr. President uh, did speak to Nigeria, saying, you know, uh, we have to get to work. I feel your pain. I, we're doing everything to ease the sufferings of Nigerians, but subsidy is here to stay. Now, Olusha, so beyond the reassurances from President Tinubu's administration, what are the perspectives of industry experts, economists, civil society groups regarding the feasibility of curbing fuel price increases while upholding the subsidy exit decision? Oh, thank you, Wing. Thank you, Wing. Uh, uh, just like uh, Dr. Johnson said, uh, when you look at uh, the food uh, uh, inflation as we speak, uh, it's on the other side. And you see, first thing one needs to actually uh, add a deep thought about is you have to just have the survivor. And the survivor only comes by you having enough to eat. There are other issues that is actually affecting our food production, and we need to talk about insecurity. How many people have been able to go back to farm in such a way that we can carry out, you know, the agricultural produce that we are known for, even to be moved up and down? And when you look at the other indices that affect in terms of logistics, uh, which complete the circle, even when you have been seen environment to practice agricultural production, you discover that the cost of, uh, of uh, logistics has uh, theoretically increased, and that on its own is affecting it. So, like I said at the initial stage, first and foremost, I think, uh, like uh, the adage in my area, we always say that when a small boy falls, he looks forward. When an elderly man falls back, he looks backward. I think it's high time as a nation we look backward. Uh, we've actually seen the, uh, the impact of uh, the decision of uh, the president in the last two and a half years, can we try and approach it in a different manner and retrace back our steps, knowing fully well that we need a functional uh, refinery to produce some of these things? It's not about even production, uh, producing that alone locally. We are talking about having other byproducts that can be used in other production arms of uh, the economy. Uh, we are complaining about the road. You know that from crude oil, you get enough uh, bitumen. Mm -hmm. You are talking about uh, getting gel. You are talking about other byproducts that is not even being, you know, converted. So when you are buying some of these imported processed fuel at an exorbitant price because of our, our foreign exchange, how about the other byproducts that we are still importing? killing the manufacturing sector. You can imagine if we process it locally, definitely you see uh, instances where manufacturing uh, company can go into other apps from the byproduct itself. Fertilizer is there for the farmers to use. It's a byproduct of also this uh, uh, crude oil uh, processing. So we can retrace back our steps and uh, give ourselves maybe the next two, three months with the incoming cabinet formation in such a way that they will now have a think tank that will look at it, that, okay, we'll give a relief, go back to drawing board, give a relief in the next three months, and see what and what we can do. By then, maybe the potato refinery they are talking about will be functional. Maybe by then that good thing will be functional. Then we have no reason to export our crude oil. We'll process it locally and have more other benefits so that that can be a relief. As a matter of fact, my issue is being uh, the, the reduction in the productivity of an average citizen. We have people work two days from home, three days from home. In fact, the calculation, Mr. Johnson said, is really hard. If you have to go three days from Ikeja to Ogba, he has done that. What if if you are moving from Moe Bafu to VI? You can imagine your cost on daily mm -hmm. visits. Then definitely you may not have the survivor of the current thing. So I think we can go back to the drawing board. We've actually seen the reaction or the, 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 the repercussion of the statement that we add, even when we don't have the cushion effect. But take it anywhere. Palliative that they want to give is a form of subsidy because it's going to cost you something. And exactly. 
on its own in subsidy. So that palliative can be invested in making sure that the refinery functions and that we retrace back a step and know that between now and December, something positive can definitely come out and Nigeria will be better for it and we'll be happy with the administration. Thank you very much, Lucia. So now, Dr. Johnson, uh, going back and retracing our steps, uh, Nigeria, I mean, crude oil should be a blessing to Nigeria. We've seen other countries that have been, that have done amazing things uh, with this. And uh, looking at our past, in order to retrace our steps, you would recall the uh, granite pyramids in the north, uh, how uh, regions were very competitive and uh, how crude oil, the, the discovery of oil suddenly uh, made us become very dependent on it, and we certainly became a monoproduct economy. Now, to what extent does President Tinubu's approach to managing the fuel price issue reflect uh, the broader uh, trends in uh, this administration's efforts to diversify uh, the economy? Are there, is there a sense? Do you sense? Uh, is there a sense of urgency uh, to diversify away from this? Uh, monoproduct economy, so we don't feel the uh, shocks of the international market and volatility. And also, uh, Mr. Olusheson spoke uh, quite well of how we can even develop our oil sector further to make gains. He talked about the derivatives of uh, crude oil, not just for PMS uh, consumption. Well, uh, what, what we need actually is consolidation. Uh, because there's no doubt that what we need to consolidate on the advantage we have, we have comparative advantage in the oil and gas sector. We also have comparative advantage in the agricultural sector. What we need is serious investment in that sector. And for that sector to try, uh, don't forget, until the discovery of crude oil, the mainstay of the Nigerian economy was, was agriculture. And um, we still have the land. The land is there at hard cost in the month of June, July, and now, because I've had costs to travel to the north, mm. in some cases by road, I've had courses to travel to the east by road when my flight was cancelled, and I've had courses to travel to 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 the uh, to the interpart in the land of the southwest. I just came back from Ikiti. So uh, I, all you need to do is just to, to look left, right, and center, and look at the arable lands which we have. So mm. when people are talking about diversification, um, it's, it's consolidation we actually re require. We need to consolidate the gains we have, and that calls for serious investment, serious investment in the agricultural sector. Now, it's not that we are not producing the products, but we are at the silos to preserve the products. We are at the, we are at the, we are at the vehicles. What are the transportation systems that will convey these, these products the, the, from, from, from these various, from, from Benue, the food basket of the nation, from Benue, from, from Kanu, from Kad all parts of Nigeria to where they are needed in, in major cities. So the in entire most cases, most of value chain of the agricultural sector has to be uh, looked at. Exactly. So, so, so what, what, what is required is, 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 what is required is for government to consolidate on the gains which we have. Consolidate on the gains which we have. Invest in, in the needed infrastructure, storage facility. Invest in, in, in transportation, in other means of transportation beyond 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 railway. Really. Open up the port in Port Tacot, open up the port in Calabar, open up the port. The deepest shoreline is 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 in, in, in Ondo State. And you know, beyond beyond the rhetoric of saying it every four four years mm. during campaign, we need government to take the right step. This country is blessed. What we are not blessed with is decisive leadership. Leadership that have the interests of this nation at heart. We shouldn't be struggling. We shouldn't be struggling. You don't need look what we, what we are taking for granted in Nigeria is what they are fighting over in Russia and Ukraine. Is what the Palestine and the Israelis are fighting over. What is it? It's land, mm. and we have this land in Nigeria, uncultivated land, green land, land that you don't need to even plant. You don't need to even waste your effort. You don't even need fertilizer to make this thing grow. Just take a trip throughout the length and breadth of this country and, and see the beauty of nature. So it's consolidation we need. Okay, it's not diversification. Because they're already there. It's just that we are not consolidated. The, the granite farmers are still there. The pancane farmers are still there. 
the rubber farmers are still there. What we need is to consolidate. What were the things we are doing in the 60s? What were the things we are doing in the 50s? Government provided subsidy. There was cocoa board. Government provided subsidy. The government provided storage facility. Government provided the needed infrastructure. In actual sense, in the 60s and the 70s, you know the richest set? You know the richest people? Mm. The richest people are not politicians. They were Industrialist. farmers. Industrialists. Yes, farmers. The richest people were farmers. The people driving Mercedes Benz, driving expensive cars in the 60s, were farmers. They were not politicians. But you know the richest people in Nigeria today? Yeah. <laughs> they are politicians. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, I'd like to bring back Gulusha so into the conversation. Now, in light of the complex interplay between fuel pricing, subsidies, and public sentiment, how do you think and what's your assessment of uh, President Tinubu's administration's communication of his administration's rational intention to both the general public and various stakeholders in the petroleum industry? From what we've seen so far, we've had Mr. President address uh, the nation uh, in the last few weeks, which was a huge departure from what Nigerians were used to in the uh, Buhari administration. We've also had uh, his spokespersons uh, address Nigerians at various points. Is this enough? And what should be done uh, to carry Nigerians along as we uh, move through this policy decisions? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I, I think the current uh, administration uh, is a bit uh, responsive uh, in carrying the uh, citizen uh, along by constantly engaging uh, the citizen with words from the special advisors. You started with uh, uh, Daily Alake. There is this constant you know, engagement, and uh, we have a feel of what is going out there. I think they can continue and strengthen that area. But it's more not more of uh, words, but we need more of action in such a way that uh, people can have confidence in some of the words that come out of there. In the next few days, we'll be talking of 100 days. What are going to be your scorecard uh, that you're going to present to the people that you've actually achieved? And also, I want to strengthen this as part of uh, the contribution by saying, how can we work on our power sector? Majority of the fuel consumption we have today uh, is on the high side, not because of uh, the number of vehicles on the road, but averagely, uh, every individual uses more than five to ten liters, considering on your load, because there is no power supply. And that on its own, it's having impact on our education. Those days, you can feel at home, relax. You know, we grew up with the atmosphere of come back from school, serve your school, siesta. Mm -hmm. You can wake up later at night and read your book. But these days, because you don't have the guarantee that there will be supply at night and there is no fuel to power up the generating set. What do you do? You start rushing yourself. It has its own impact on your health. So, in as much as we are working on it, can we build infrastructure in terms of power? That is going to help those in fintech world. If the technology at which we are operating now must work effectively, it rides mostly on the, the uh, on power. Most of the telcos today are having a, a high cost of uh, operating cost. Majorly, the major contributing factor to this is power. So if you can work on power, definitely the pressure we have on the consumption of fuel will drastically go down. Then it can give that best thing, uh, the best innovation that you have in every child. Uh, then, uh, well, how do you think uh, a child who you call an average student get to the developed client, and you see them becoming the best. It's because mm. the system in that area gives the child to prepare, relax. There are times, there, there, there are time and season for everything. And that was the nature at which we grow, not what we have currently. So in as much as we are talking about uh, let them work on the petroleum, I love the initiative of them separating power from the current energy sector to have you know, the energy and uh, gas uh, ministry. So that that can definitely eject certain mm -hmm. uh, uh, the gas that we're wasting into the production of uh, power that is needed. And I think with that, we'll, we'll make it an headway. But in terms of communication, I think this administration is starting on a good note. But uh, we will definitely start matching their works with their deliverables. That is the way we have it in the private sector. KPI, you already have your key indices that you have mm -hmm. the promise. What are the performance that is attributable 
So the timeline that you have given on the deliverables, that you have, if you have failed short of that, then definitely they will know that the citizen will react. So I think in terms of communication, they're trying. But if you match action with some of the words and promises that they can give us, because time waits for no one. Thank you very much, Olusha. So now, Dr. Johnson, as we begin to wind down conversation, uh, uh, wind down this conversation, uh, could you provide insights into the potential challenges and opportunities President Tinubu's administration might encounter as it wants to clean up inefficiencies uh, within the petroleum sector, especially considering uh, resistance from vested interest or bureaucratic obstacles? Because you said uh, during this program that you know, there's no cabals or group of people that should uh, be mightier than the state. And the state has everything in its powers to deal with it. You also suggested a reversal of the subsidy uh, regime. So how can he do this and what sort of obstacles uh, will he face? Now, the president took a decisive step with respect to EFCC. The president took a decisive step with respect to central bank government, even though Central bank, um, central bank administration, even though in those two cases, I have my reservation with the approach with which the administration have gone about prosecuting whatever uh, mm. case they have against Bauer and, and the MFLA. This is, this is a democracy. There are standard operating procedure with which to prosecute issues. You bring yeah. allegation against them, or you set up a panel to investigate, and whatever allegations you have against them, you bring it before them, before the court, Rather than perpetual, uh, perpetual um, detention, but perpetual detention, but it was decisive with respect to that. The approach, I disagree. A critical area that a lot of us expected the president to have a decisive approach is the NNPC. Mm, many people have thought that military. You see, you can't clean an onion stable mm. if you don't bring out all the horses in the stable. So. The, 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 the entire nation relies on proceed from NNPC, from the oil and gas, from crude mm. oil. And it's, it's NNPC the over goose. the years have demonstrated to be an institution of the state that is bigger than the state. So we had expected that where the president will have, what the president will have done is to have changed the management or probably suspend the management, bring in a new management team. Uh, because if you listen to what was said by the former APC chairman and now senator representing Edo North and former governor of Edo State, as well as the special advisor mm. to the president on media and publicity, with respect to blaming the last administration, as if the last administration was not an APC administration. Mele Kiari was part and parcel of that administration. He was part, uh, in fact, he, 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 in his administration of mm. NNPC, it was the NNPC did not subject itself to the oversight function of the national of the national assembly. So uh, we are talking that the president today. will get rid will get rid of the management team of the NNPC. Okay. Uh, uh, the on, on, on that note, Dr. Johnson, I'm afraid we have uh, quickly run out of time. I'd like to say a big thank you to you, Dr. G.D. Johnson, Director of Special Programs it's a pleasure at, the, to be with uh, you. at the Nigerian Institute of Journalism. Always a pleasure. And also, Olusha Sonkwade, a Public Affairs Analyst. We do appreciate your insights and contribution uh, to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having us.